is an Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Unspoiled, the book club, childhood favorites, covering. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret, by Judy Bloom. In this book, man, I had forgotten about how terrible her grandparents are. This is tough, guys. Yikes. Welcome to Unspoiled. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. And I'm Carrie. Yay! We've got a new guest, guys. Hi! I'm excited because um, I didn't really do guests all that much, and the Childhood Favorites has really opened up a lot of doors in that department. So please, introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. My name is Carrie Ann Farrell. I am one of the co-hosts of Go Your Own YA podcast, where we talk about lesser known young adult fiction from mostly the 90s and early 80s but we kind of expand that definition to include whatever we want to talk about really um i'm also a preschool teacher a musician and a writer i've got my first young adult novel coming out this coming tuesday nice this tuesday oh my god that's so exciting thank you what is it called it's called forward march and if the title doesn't tip you off it's about Marching band nerds. Nice. Yeah. Wow, that's really exciting. You must be so, like, on tenterhooks about that. I am. I'm like, <laughs> That's basically and, uh, what it is. The Go Your Own YA is a really clever name, and I like that. So props to you guys for coming up with that one. Thank you. That was my co-host, Marie. She, she comes up with the good ideas. I go along. <laughs> Um, so what, when I, um, the, the reason that you're guesting on this show is because we're in a lady podcasting group on Facebook and I posted about how I was looking for people to guest for various books. And I posted a list of the books that I was, um, either thinking of or books that I had not read myself and you jumped on this one. What's important to you about this book in particular? Well, I'm a child of the late 70s, early 80s, so prime Judy Bloom era, and um, this one I loved as a kid. It was, you know, I think for many girls my my age or in that kind of Gen X era, um, it was how we learned about stuff. Judy Mm -hmm. Bloom was kind of like our big sister or our like cool aunt who told Mm -hmm. us the stuff that maybe our moms didn't quite know how to tell us about yet. Mm -hmm. So Margaret was very special to me because of that. I read it when I was um, maybe third or fourth grade and um, just loved it. I wanted to have a cool club like she and her friends do. I wanted my period so badly. Okay, now that's interesting because this was the thing that I wanted to ask you about. For me, her her worries about puberty were not the thing that I related to. And I wanted to ask you if that was something that you identified with because for me, the story, my parents were two different religions. And so <gasps> oh, that's the thing that I really related to. So, because... For some reason, I was just so unconcerned. I'm like, yeah, I'll get my period. And I got my period when I was nine, as it turns out. So that was not super fun. Um, and no. that might be part of why I wasn't worried some. I don't know if I read this before or after that. I think before, though. So why, what, why did you want it so bad? Like, what were, what were your feelings about that? I thought growing up sounded really exciting. I thought it sounded very exciting <sighs> and glamorous. I didn't get my period until I was 14 and a half. Oh my God. Yeah. So I had pretty much given up hope. I knew Judy Bloom didn't get hers until she was like 16. And Mm -hmm. that I think plays into, you know, why she wrote this book where everyone's like freaked out about when are we going to get our periods? Um, So I was like, if I get it before 16, then at least I'm doing 
puberty better than Judy Blue. Okay. I so, see that. Yeah. So I don't know. That was, that was important to me. And I wonder if part of it was, it was important to me because it was important to Margaret. Mm. And because I read that book at a formative age, if you look back at my like sixth grade diaries, they sound like Margaret. They're like, when am I going to grow? When am I going to get my period? When am I going to look like, you know, the Laura's of my middle school class? And I wonder how much of that was me just kind of absorbing Margaret's persona and taking on her her concerns because I thought that's what you were supposed to do. Okay, yeah, that makes sense actually. I never really thought about that influencing like I I just thought of it as what do be other people identify with, but it makes sense if you're young a young child reading this that you would just start to take on those concerns even if previously you hadn't known that they should be a concern in the first place. Right. Um and yeah, cuz it, it was just that was the part when I I remember reading it as a kid that I was the most confused by personally was the fact that she seems so worried about it. And I was like, Margaret, you can't control it. And it's going to happen whenever. Why are you so worried? And I like, I was so puzzled by that. And I, I I think I actually talked about it with my mom and I was like, she keeps talking about how she wants to get it. And I know when you get yours, you hate it. So why does she want it so bad? (laughs) And my my mom was just like, I don't know, but she'll be sorry. And I was like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I love how zen you were. That's wonderful. In in some respects. Not everything, but just <laughs> when it came to that. Um, but all right, let me back up a little bit. So let's talk about Margaret. Um, the book opens with her talking to God. And she ha- is going to be moving with her family from Manhattan to New Jersey. And there's an implication that they're moving just to get away from her grandmother. Yes. But I'm not entirely sure how valid that is or if that's like Margaret. I feel like Margaret's pretty perceptive. So if she thinks that's part of it, it probably is. Yes, I'm sure that's part of it as well as, you know, it's a marker of success. And Margaret's family seems to be like, you know, many people we have the money we can move to the suburbs we can live in new jersey and it'll be green and peaceful we'll still get to go to manhattan and enjoy all of that and everything the city has to offer but we'll have lawns right lawns Very big that on the lawns. we do not want to take care of anymore because we sliced <laughs> our finger open on the freaking lawnmower <laughs> i forgot that scene i've had Me an accident <laughs> oh my god um and I had forgotten, too, because uh, Margaret's father, he's, like, a a little overexcited about doing all of the um, yard care himself. Cuts himself pretty bad on the lawnmower because he forgets to turn it off before he removes the bag for the clippings. Mm -hmm. And the police come. I know. What? (laughs) What's that about? I, I was, like, I was listening to the audiobook for this, and I just stopped and was, like, wait, why like what are they gonna do like there was no attack it's not like they're gonna the arrest the lawnmower like, right <laughs> it was just such a weird little detail and i don't think i like even thought about it for a second as a kid but no. and now as an adult i'm like what why would they even do that even in the 80s when when service was very different than it is now as we know from uh mm. some who was it getting like a delivery of gretchen i think it is they get the yes. pads and stuff delivered to the house. So fancy. So fancy. Um, but yeah, I just, that little, there, there are a few details in here that really do, uh, what's the word when you, when something places it in a spot in time. Yeah. It really pinpoints it to 1970. And I wanted to ask you, what edition did you read for this one? Cause it's been revised as I'm sure, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, things have been changed. So I was, I picked up an edition that still had all the 1970 stuff intact, which is wonderful. And I'm I so glad I did. I think that's the version that I read the first time when I was younger. And even then, cause I, you know, I was born in 84 and I think that, um, 
it was just starting to be pulled off the shelves. Like, 98 was when they revised it, if I'm not mistaken, with um, updating nice. all of the, like, the sanitary napkin belt, mm-hmm. which yeah. is the thing that I read. And when I listened to the audiobook, I was waiting for that to come up because mm-hmm. I didn't realize yet that they had revised it. Yeah. And it's just a pad with, like, the sticky back. Yep. And I, I was remember. like, oh, that's weird. I didn't know that they were going to do that. Yep. I remember asking my mom, like, after I read Margaret, I basically made my mom give me, like, the period talk. And I remember asking her, like, well, what about the belts? She's like, oh, they don't exist. We don't do that anymore. They're pads. They're really easy. Let me show you. Can you imagine? Like, I'm just, how archaic is that? And I'm wondering, because part of my understanding of all of this beyond just the book um when i say my parents were two different religions my mother was like a goddess worshiping pagan and she had a friend who made um reusable pads out of like fancy colored fabrics and whatnot oh wow and uh i think that was part of like i saw my mom with these reusable pads and i thought those clipped to a belt And assumed, and it turns out that they had, like, a bit of Velcro on each side, so it would go Mm -hmm. under your panties and, like, Velcro together underneath. Um, But, yeah, I still thought for a while that that was what people were using and that it was actual fabric, too. And I just, I can't imagine having that friggin', like, basically, it's a garter belt. Yeah. But I just, that's such a weird solution. Is it, like, did we not have regular panties for so long? Is that why? Yeah, I can't imagine why. Like, I know that there is a museum of menstruation and women's health. In, is there? Oh my god, that makes sense. There is. I've never been there. It's in some guy's basement or something. Excuse me? <laughs> yeah, uh, some guy runs it. Oh, oh no, it's closed now. He was in Maryland. I guess that's why I knew about it, because that's where I come from. But um, it was in this guy's house. That's super creepy and a little bit suspect, and I'm not entirely comfortable with that, actually. That's not a place I would have gone, I don't think. No. Yikes. So... Margaret is concerned about making friends here, but it actually turns out to not be a problem because in another, like, in another moment that really shows you what time this is set in, there's, like, a circular that has her name and information and their address and, like, the family's, like, a short history of them that's given to everybody in the neighborhood so they all that's know who they are. so creepy. Isn't her it? Her new neighbor, Nancy, comes to the door and is like, hi, I know who you are. You're Margaret Simon. You're 11 years old. And, like, I know all about you because I read the circular and Margaret's, like, blink, blink. Right. <laughs> I wonder how common of a, an occurrence that is, because Margaret seems taken aback by it, but of course she's a kid, so she might not just know that that's a thing. She's a kid, and she's a city kid. Yeah, and true, so this, true. this is all new to her. And Judy Bloom re- revisits that theme throughout her books, which is interesting. The um, Manhattan kid moving out to New Jersey, I think Superfudge does it really well, too. I never read Superfudge. Oh. I should put that on the list. Superfudge taught me the truth about Santa Claus, and I will always be a little bit bitter about it. Oh, no. Maybe that's why I haven't read it. Maybe my parents shielded me from it. (laughs) Okay, well, in that case, Santa's totally real. I'm sorry. (laughs) Forget everything I just said. (laughs) You're right. I don't know why you felt the need to even say it out loud. Um, So Margaret's friend, and I put friend in quotes because Nancy's real questionable. Uh. Nancy comes over and sort of takes Margaret under her wing. She's the one who starts the club, um, the preteen sensations, which is amazing. Yes. And she's obsessed with getting boobs and getting her period and in like wants to be the first one to get her period so bad that when she isn't, she straight lies about getting it. Unfortunately, Margaret is there when she does and it, completely outs her as a giant fake and she tries to be like well i really thought i got it that one time i wasn't just making it all up and i'm like "Mm, Mm. you don't mistake anything for blood no that's not how that goes um 
Do, were you like I wanted when I read this as a kid? I wanted Margaret to stop being friends with Nancy. Yeah, I understood why she was friends with Nancy because it's like at that age, it can feel better to be friends with someone who's not a good friend mm-hmm. than to have no friends at all. Yeah, and if you lose Nancy, you probably lose Gretchen and Janie too because Nancy could probably turn them on you. True. And you're out of the preteen sensations. And then who are you going to hang out with? And Nancy lives like right next door or like a couple yeah. sto- like stories down, stories down, houses down. Yeah. Um, so that could be awkward. And you're right because Nancy's like, we find out later about the stories that she told about Laura Danker are complete fabrications that she yeah. just made up because she's jealous of that girl. So, she, obviously, she has no qualms about doing that and would do that about Margaret, too, more oh, than likely. Oh, absolutely. She'd make um, something up. Yeah. Yeah, and I had forgotten that resolution to the Laura Danker thing. Was Me, that, too. I just, for some reason, I had it in my head that Moose and Nancy's brother, whose name I forget, are the ones that make it up. And the mm-hmm. way that Moose reacts when Margaret confronts him, it's very yeah. clear he knows nothing about this and Nancy yeah. made it up. Exactly. That's really interesting because, you know, I was feeling the same way going into it. Like, oh, yeah, didn't didn't Nancy's brother and Moose have this, like, story that they told about Laura? And, no, they're not making it up. And yeah. they're totally shocked. But Moose is when he hears about it. Yeah. It's so, it's such, it's so heartbreaking. Like, even as a child reading this, I could recognize that Laura, like this was a particular pet peeve of mine as a kid because I had had enough education in like what our bodies do and are like that. I knew certain things were myths, but people bought into them so much. Like Mm -hmm. the idea that if a girl has a thigh gap, she's not a virgin, these kinds of like bullshit ideas, you know? And so many kids in my classes would 100% believe it. And I was like, I don't know how you can be this fucking stupid. What is wrong with you? Oh, my God. Like, I get so mad about it. And so even as a kid reading this, I was like, why do they hate her? She hasn't done anything wrong. And then to hear Nancy not only made up the story, but throughout, she's talking about how the teacher is also, like, ogling Laura. Her obsession with the teacher looking at Laura super uh, gross like yeah nancy's got issues she does though that's true and i feel bad for that teacher because mr uh what's his name mr benjamin miles j benedict jr benedict that's the one he the poor guy he's trying his best and he finally starts to like get it under control a little bit but when mm-hmm. he shows up he's only 24 which i can't yeah. wrap my brain oh, around my that God. like what and he comes into this not knowing how to discipline a class not knowing how to like handle them from day to day and not knowing how to tell them this is the assignment and not react to them being like whiny babies about it because of course they want are going to be because they don't want to do work whether or not it's interesting at all right they're 11 yeah and he, so he's just crushed. I would hope, I hope that you would find this interesting. I know. They, he gives him an assignment. I was like, oh, sweetie. And the assignment, it's so like a first year teacher thing. And I say this as a teacher, like do a project on something. Right. And then hand something in. Yeah. There's no, like, like that's literally what it is. Yeah. I, I was waiting for his explanation of what the project was to continue. I know. And then it was over and I was like, oh, that's it. Okay. So she just sent in an, a letter to him that took her like 20 minutes to write, you know? Um, yeah. And she has no conclusion. And I think that's something we definitely need to talk about the whole religion thing. Cause mm-hmm. this is, um, kind of what the book meant to you. And the fact that there's this whole conflict throughout the book about, what religion Margaret's going to be and if any at all. And she ends feeling just as confused as before. Mm -hmm. That's real. And that is gutsy on Judy Bloom's part. Yeah. Did you have any struggles with religion as a kid growing up? Well, I was raised Catholic 
And, you know, it was very much expected that this is the thing you do. You go to Sunday school, you go to like confession, you get your first communion, blah, blah, blah. And Mm -hmm. so I mostly went along and did that. Um, I didn't have my crisis of religion until I was in college. And, um, I am not a part of any church now. My husband is Jewish and is culturally Jewish more than anything else. And so, like, Margaret's parents, like, were the classic, like, Catholic girl, Jewish boy combination. And so for a while we went to a Unitarian church. Mm Mm-hmm. That'll do it. Yep. (laughs) Exactly. And we don't do that anymore because it was too much like having a third job. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Yeah. And that so that makes sense because that seems like a big thing out here in Texas is like the the church community is like how people make friends. So I could see it right. being intense like that. Right. And it's the same in Margaret's neighborhood. Like Nancy says to her, Well you have to like you have to be something, otherwise how are you gonna know if you're gonna join the Y or the J and mm-hmm. That throws Margaret for a loop because that's not something she had to worry about in Manhattan. Yeah. Yeah, I just, like, when I was, so, a lot of people who are familiar with Unspoiled will know this because this comes up in a lot of stuff that I cover. But um, I grew up with two parents who were neither of them particularly religious but very into holidays and Halloween and decorating and all this stuff. And um, around age six or seven... My father OD'd and my mom kicked him out and he started going to AA and he found Christ and became a born again. And when I say he became a born again, I mean he became the kind of conspiracy theory believing, chemtrails in the sky theory, like the kind of... of born again that's almost not even Christian because it's so loaded with superstition and strange like government conspiracy beliefs and he didn't want to get a tree anymore at Christmas he was certainly not going to celebrate Halloween fundamentalist to the Mm -hmm. extreme my mother meanwhile to deal with my father and his drug addiction and his OD started to go to meditation and that led her to like pagan communities and gradually to like goddess goddess worship and drum circles and all of this kind of stuff like when i got my period we had a celebratory drum circle in which they all gave me like a little gift and it was really humiliating and i hated it so very much oh my god um and so i was i was brought up with my mother in this incredibly like woman-centric feminist sort of like earth magic mindset And my father bringing me to his crazy church every Sunday. And I had to go with him every single Sunday until I was 18. And it was brutal. And I, they caught me, either they caught me too late or it was just never going to work. Because I sat through those church services dumbfounded at the things that people believed. And angry that I had to listen to this garbage. And disgusted with my father that he believed it and really angry with my mother that she made me go that she didn't believe this either but she was like well he's also your father and he wants to bring you and i don't get to just keep him from doing anything regarding religion with you so when i read this it was one of those situations where reading this made me feel like like this is an even more normal situation than it was so i got this idea that plenty of kids go through this and then when i started to actually meet and become friends with kids and talk about it i realized that i had never met a single solitary other person that had this struggle that margaret in the book was the only like kind of character that I would ever meet that understood where I was coming from because otherwise kids were either the same religion, both parents or no religion at all. And it never actually came up as a problem. And when her grandparents visit reading it as a kid, my dad and his church were were 
so pushy also that I didn't really appreciate how awful that scene is because that was what I felt like was constantly happening all the time. And I was shocked at Margaret, like getting angry and yelling at them and running out. And I was Mm. like, girl, why are you flipping out? Chill. They're just being the way that people are about religion. Oh my God. And then reading it now, I'm like my head in my hands, just like, Oh my God, you guys disowned your daughter. And then you're going to come back and do do this shit again. Did not get this as an, as a kid at all. That's amazing. Yeah, I remember reading that and having absolutely no way to relate to it. Like, it seemed like so completely like out of the realms of anything I had experienced. And I felt for poor Margaret, it just sounded awful. And that I, I think really what I didn't absorb fully was how long it had been it's one thing to read the words 14 years barbara yes. but as a grown-up when you hear that it just means something totally different to you so they didn't want to acknowledge that they even had a daughter for longer than margaret's been alive right and now they're just gonna and they didn't even call to see if it was okay they just sent a letter and are like oh we're coming yeah. I'm with Margaret's dad. I think they wanted to go to New York and then they were like, well, maybe we should stop by. Mm-hmm. Like I maybe right. something got, something in them got to them and was like, you know, maybe this is the time and you know, it'll just be a little bit and you won't like have to see that horrible Jewish man that she's married to for too long. And then you can go and see Go and see a play. Go see a chorus line. Well, they probably wouldn't have seen a chorus line. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to think of what was on Broadway then. Camelot, maybe. <laughs> oh my god, yeah. And they're like, complete... The I can't tell, reading it, if this is genuine shock or if it's put on for the sake of starting the argument. But when her grandmother asks, how are you doing in Sunday school? And Margaret says, I don't go to Sunday school. You don't? Bitch, that's why y'all don't Mm. talk anymore. Right. Why would you think that they, that she just allowed you to disown her, but then continued to raise her child as a Christian? That doesn't, that's the point. That's her way of starting that conversation. Yeah, I think you're right. In a very, like polite, passive-aggressive Midwestern way. Mm-hmm. And how about Sunday school? It was so gross. Oh, and it it's heartbreaking because Margaret was going to spend the week with her grandmother in Florida, and these assholes just tell them when they're coming. It's not even... And that's more evidence, I think, to support the idea that they were going to New York anyway. Yes. It's not when is it convenient for us to come. It's we are coming, here's when, because that was already planned. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. (sighs) All of this makes me hate them so much more. I know. And I was angry at Margaret's mother. I understand her wanting to see her parents again. I really do. But the way they treated her husband, for her to ask him to, like, invite them into his home and behave as if everything is cordial between Mm -hmm. them after this sort of treatment is I just feel like she's really demanding too much from him I feel like it's really unfair yeah I don't blame him for being upset I don't know if I were in that position if I would be able to be cordial at all yeah I don't think I'd be able to welcome them into the house yeah I don't I don't know. I'd I'd just be like, you guys can make reservations at a restaurant and they can stay in a hotel. Yeah. I I just don't think. And and the fact that my significant other even asked me to deal with this would be quite a problem. I agree. Yeah. You know. (sighs) You disowned your daughter for marrying me. No, I'm not going to welcome you into my house. Mm Mm-hmm. 
and let you be an influence on my child so that she right. can also hate me. Thanks. No. Um, so yeah, the religion thing was just, and she goes to the, the part that kind of killed me is that the grandmother that she is close to, she tells her that she wants to go to temple with her and her grandmother seizes on this as proof that she is a Jewish girl. Yes. And come on, grandma, come on. Like as cool as you are, you still just can't just be cool Mm. about this. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's no being cool about that for the grandparents on either side. It's a battle. And it's it's, it's not a like battle she for Margaret try. Soul. It really, you're it right. It is, yeah. That's what they, how they see it. That's true. Um, but it's like she really tries to like restrain herself in bringing it up on her own, and she doesn't want to like push buttons. And she often tells Margaret, "Well, do X, Y, but don't tell your mother." Like she knows that they don't want her to be too much of a bad mm-hmm. influence. Yeah. But it is as soon as Margaret brings it up, that's it. Like she feels yeah. certain that now anything goes because the subject has been broached at all. Like the seal is broken. Mm-hmm. Um. So Margaret goes to Temple, and she goes to two different. She goes to a Methodist church and a Catholic church, right? She stops in the Catholic church after um, after she's working on the project with Laura. She goes into right. the confessional. I can't remember what other Christian denomination she goes to. I feel like there was an Episcopal in it there It might have been Episcopal, yeah. Yeah. Um, and she talks to God, like that's, you know, the whole title of the book, on her own time and prays. Mm-hmm. And really says that she feels God's presence. But when she goes into these temples and churches, she doesn't feel God there at all. The closest she gets, I think, is one of the services she goes to on Christmas when mostly the choir is singing. And it sounds mm-hmm. pretty. I related mm-hmm. to that a lot as a kid because that's where I got most of my spiritual fulfillment out of anything, any church service I was going to. and. Like Margaret, I went to a lot of different Christian services because I was a singer. And so my choir would like go to all the churches in town and we sang all over town in at different church services. So I saw what a lot of them were like, and I started making up, making my own ideas about like what kind of a church community I wanted and mm-hmm. like my own thoughts about religion and you know, eventually as an adult that led me, like I said, to religious crisis and then Unitarian Universalism and then um, Church of Sleeping Late and Getting Brunch, which is basically what I do now. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Praise its name. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I really heartily agree on the music thing. That's been, that is honestly like, one of the make or break moments for me, if I have, because I've mm-hmm. gone to a lot of different churches. My dad's yeah. mostly, but his family is all Catholic. Um, him, he's Colombian. So yes, of course they're Catholic. Yeah. And I got dragged to all kinds of stuff and the music was really the thing. Yeah. And I was always shocked when I would get excited for the music and then it would be bad yes. and not just like bad singing, but like, Owen's grandmother, um, Owen's my fiance, Mm -hmm. his grandmother's part of a cantata in her church. And they invited us to the Easter service. And I was really excited because the word cantata evoked this medieval music sort of. Yes. Nope. Oh, no. It's real modern, repetitive, like. And Christ the Lord. Oh God! Like that kind oh, of sound. Oh, that's the worst. Oh. And they they had like the the synth music backing oh, track no. playing on the speakers while they sang instead of even oh, having like God. a piano or being it. It was awful, and it just it's the kind of thing that it's not just not good music. It's actively grating music. Yeah, that I yeah. can't wait for it to be over. You know. <laughs> Exactly. No, I understand. There was a brief period where um, the UU church I went to switched over to having like a Unitarian praise band 
which just praise think band. about that for a moment. You, you praise band is a very interesting thing. It did not work out well. It actively drove me away for a while. Mm. Yeah, there. The one time that, and and you saying that that's the one place that she felt it. I'm realizing that's like kind of one of the few times in the past decade that I have. Before I left Philadelphia, right before I got divorced, I spent one last Christmas with my ex-husband, and we went to a giant Methodist church in the center of Philadelphia for Christmas Eve service. And it was the kind of thing that you will never forget for the rest of your life. We walked in, and they had all of these Christmas trees that had never been purchased by anyone, fresh cut ones lining the doorways inside so you step in and it's just the smell of fresh fur everywhere and there was almost no lights there were a few candles so it was like dark and really like just moody and like evocative and you're walking through this tunnel of trees before you get out into the sanctuary which is it looked like it had been pulled straight out of London and the, the music was all the kind of like really classic ancient carols that people don't even know yeah. that I had listened to all the time growing up I and love uh, that stuff. it was amazing the kind of the kind of thing where there's like the choir singing and then you have one high note over the top that you never Ooh. hear but on a CD somebody execute it that perfectly just like arcing out over the music and yeah. I remember just listening and just like all of a sudden just tears and I was just crying for practically the entire service from beginning again. It was just unbelievable. Sounds amazing. But it was. If anybody has a chance to go to Philly for Christmas, they have an awesome like uh, Christmas carnival is the wrong word. It's like a village that sells Mm -hmm. like mold uh, mold, wine and cider and schnitzel. There's a lot of like German food. And the church is nearby, and that combo of doing the village all afternoon and then going to the church, it's just oh. the coolest thing. So yeah, I think you're right. Music is like kind of the thing. And I have a hard time listening to music on my downtime, because I have such an emotional reaction to it so mm-hmm. much of the time, that I don't like to open that door, yeah. unless I have some time to wallow, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, for Margaret, it's so personal her relationship to god it's Mm -hmm. the music that she hears in the services that's the closest she gets to her personal relationship where it's just her and god and she's talking and it's kind of like her own i mean she's praying and it's a conversation it's like hey god i want to tell you about this thing that happened today and I wonder what her perception of God is, like, who she imagines she's talking to. That's never really discussed. It's true. Like, what she imagines when she says, hey, are you there, God? Yeah. That's true. I kind of, I, I like that Bloom doesn't get into that too much, so it allows yes. the reader to just put whatever they feel like putting there. Um, and... There is a period where she gets mad at God yes. and decides that God is not on her side and she stops talking to God entirely. I ha- I say he automatically, which I should not really do. It is not on her side. Mm-hmm. He, she. Um, God. Right. And there are a couple moments where she automatically starts talking to God and then stops herself and is like, but I did miss it, though. Yeah. And what restores her faith getting her period? Girl, she crazy. (laughs) Oh my god. I knew you wouldn't miss this god. I knew you would be here for this. (laughs) (laughs) She's like not even quite twelve either, right? When she gets it. Right. Yeah, I think she's just turned really young, really. Yeah, well, average... Is it about average to get it at 12? Is it? I, I feel like the, av- the average goes has been going down and down, and now it is... I feel like it's more in the 10 to 12 range. Probably should Google that. I'm checking this out right now yeah. as we speak. 
uh, 12.5 years old today. Oh, wow. Really? Um, this might not seem like a huge jump, but it's still a steady decline that should be noted when there are girls getting their period as young as seven or eight. Yeah. Yeah, my, mine was at nine. Yeah. And it was such a bummer, like getting cramps at age nine so that you I can't thought... go out and play with your friends. Like, yeah, you know, I was yelling at the book when I was rereading it last night because they were feeding the girls that line about how it never hurts. I know. Thank you. I forgot all about that. Yeah. That was something I wanted to mention. And I, I remember being told that and then you know, getting cramps for the first time and like knowing what they were and being like, they lied. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like maybe the actual action of bleeding doesn't hurt that. Yeah. Like that is the know, part I think that they tried to like help girls not be afraid of like, mm -hmm. I'm going to be bleeding. The blood's going to hurt, but mm -hmm. yeah, but the cramps hurt. <laughs> Yeah, there's only one very tiny mention when Gretchen gets hers and right. saying that, oh, there was some cramping. And uh, that's the one, like, issue that I, I have with Bloom is that she doesn't really, like, dig into that at all. And I don't know if that's just because she personally didn't have a lot of cramping, so she didn't really right. get how it could be. But um, that and also the fact that the presentation that they are given about all of this is basically... A huge advertisement yes. for private lady products, <laughs> which is so accurate to, like, I don't think per, it, when I went to school there was a presentation like this, but that feels so legit. Oh, yeah. We had a movie, and after the movie, we got, like, booklets. They didn't give us, like swag bags or anything right. but they gave us like we didn't even get to keep the booklets but they were seriously like what every girl should know and you know it was like diaries of four girls writing back to each and for or letters writing back and forth to each other today i got my period i got my period too and it seemed very margaret-esque and very exciting to me but it was like sponsored by playtex or whatever so yeah and I, you know, I get that to a point, yeah. but I love the fact that Margaret's reaction is to immediately vow never to use private lady products ever. I know. Like, there are moments with Margaret that I really just want to high five her because yeah. she gets it so well. So She's a great narrator. Like so many Judy Bloom characters, like she's real and she's relatable and she is so funny. She is really funny. Um... Just the way that she talks about Nancy, too. And she never outright is like, God, what a bitch. All she has to do is really tell you what Nancy said. Yeah. And then it's just like, I privately thought to myself, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, moments like where Nancy's like, well, I'll probably be next, I guess. And Margaret and the other girl, Josie? Can't even remember. Jill? That. Oh, no. I, she's such a nobody that I don't even remember. Yeah, she doesn't really do anything. But they, she says, we looked at each other. We guessed so, too. Yeah. Like, there's this sort of resignation about who the most grown-up is, even if she turns out to be lying. She still does wind up getting it before the other two. Right. Um, and... The the way that Margaret, like, deals with her parents versus her grandmother, who is... Her grandmother, despite her being a little too pushy, is awesome. Yes. I do wish that I had had a grandma like this. Because I had a Colombian grandma who cooked all the time and was, you know... She, we could not communicate because she only spoke Spanish. And then I had another grandma who was uh, kind of one of those, like, nervous types that never really left the house if she could help it. And there was no anything like this. Did you have good My, grandparents? Yeah, I had um, two amazing grandmothers. And my maternal grandmother reminds me a bit of um, Margaret's grandma, her dad's mom. Um, suburban New Jersey. Um, close enough to New York to be able to go in on the train. Um, nice. And was very much like, she didn't knit, so I didn't get expressly made for you by grandma sweaters, which is a detail I love so much. But 
she was very committed to spoiling the crap out of all of her grandchildren. And I was her first grandchild. And for a long time, Uh. I was the only girl. So I was very well spoiled by her. I, I'm an only child, and I was the first of the, like, new generation. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I feel you on that. I got real spoiled for a while there. <laughs> um, now, one thing I did want to talk about was the party. Yes. At Fishbin's house, Fishbein. First of all, what the fuck is his mom doing leaving a bunch of 12-year-olds alone in the basement with food and whatnot? For prolonged periods of time. Because you don't yeah. leave kids this age totally unsupervised. Absolutely not. Well, my first boy-girl party that was, like, officially a boy-girl party happened right around the time I read this book. And so it was, like, third or fourth grade. And it was so, like, we didn't play any kissing games, although the, the girl who, like, hosted the party really wanted it to become that kind of party. Mm-hmm. But it was so very much like this one, like the girls had it in their head that it was going to be like fancy kissing boy girl party. The boys like popped all the balloons in the room and like tackled each other and like threw food everywhere, just like in this party. And um, my friend's mom did not come downstairs, so she did not give an excellent lecture on the hanky panky. But oh my god! I love that abominable lecture. Behavior. Yes, abominable behavior and hanky panky. Um, and you're right. Like, what did she expect? She comes downstairs, and they've all loaded up their straws with mustard and like, thrown it up it's at the all ceiling. Over the ceiling. <laughs> oh my god! I would be I would be so mad too. But like, seriously. This is the exact age where kids are, like, starting to really test boundaries and figure right. out because they're, like, on the verge of being a teenager. And to them, that means something very different than being a teenager means to parents. Yeah. Well, she is definitely a clueless mom. And I'm betting that she is the one who put this party together, not knowing that her son, like, being so clueless, she doesn't know her son is, like, the biggest drip, which... Mm. Such a 1970 word. I love it. The yes. biggest drip in the class. And everybody goes to the party, which shocks me. I think it's because she invited the entire class. I really don't know that everybody would have gone if they didn't know that literally every other person that they yeah. see every day was going to be there. So they all had a like guaranteed friend that would probably be in residence as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And now that I say that 28 kids, 28 kids she had in her basement and she left them alone. I wouldn't do it with 10. I know. I wouldn't do it at all. (laughs) I would never have 12 year olds at my house if I could help it. 12 year olds are the worst, especially 12 year old boys. And the kissing party, I never had a a party like this in any, uh, like, until high school. And even in high school, there was only the one. And it was very out of hand. (laughs) It got way too serious. Um, But I had very false expectations of what parties would be based on this book. I I remember that specifically. (laughs) At the infamous boy-girl party of our class, um, my friend who threw it wanted to have, like, a prom sort of thing where everyone voted on who would be the king and queen of the party. King and queen, lord and lady were the next runner-ups, and then the third runner-ups would be the duke and the duchess of the party. She did not win queen of the party, and so she threw a fit. While the boys were popping the balloons. She didn't get queen of her own party. No. That's cold-blooded. I know. So that's really when the party kind of fell apart. (laughs) Dude, she's throwing the party. Let her be the queen. (laughs) Oh my god, that's hilarious. But yeah, I would be pissed too. 
don't yeah. give me that. I would I definitely reach a point where I'm like, oh, really? I'm not. All right. Well, then you all can leave then. Bye. I get so mad. But that's a pretty interesting idea. I've never heard of anybody doing that. I know. King and queen thing at their own party in the front. I guess that's why. Yeah. Probably the parents can see that that might happen. Yeah. And they're like, you know what? Why don't we not do that this time? Yeah. Um, was there anything else that like that was distinctly something you identified with or else maybe like the party thing set you up to think something was going to be a certain way as you got older and it turned out to not be that way at all? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it was really, really the party scene and, you know, as we've talked about, like, I expected my period to happen a lot sooner than it did. Mm -hmm. And I expected it to be something that was a lot more like exciting and like fanfare heralding my entry into womanhood instead Mm -hmm. of like, Oh God, like I have to buy supplies for this thing and I get cramps and like, sometimes I feel faint and yeah, like we only get like five minutes in the, like, in between classes to go to the bathroom, and, like, I can't run to the bathroom and, like, take care of this, and I'm going to be late for my class. Like, it was just a pain. Yeah, it it's not uh, exciting. Despite me be feeling humiliated at what my mom's mm. drum circle did, at least it did feel, like, ceremonial. Like, yeah. I think that's something that, um, that in the Jewish tradition, having, like, bar and bat mitzvahs, is a nice sort of like milestone for kids that we don't really have in our culture enough. And I think it's sort of important and I don't really know what could take the place of that, but right. I'd like to see something like that. That's not tied up with religion. Mm -hmm. Because like for me, that was um, confirmation and it didn't, again, it didn't feel like much of anything. Yeah. Like I knew going into it that like people leave the church I could very well leave the church as I did. And so like, what was I even committing to? And like my sponsor, my confirmation sponsor was not able to be there. She was having a baby. Um, and then they actually left, she left the church immediately. (laughs) And because there wasn't a Catholic church near where they were, where they moved. It was like, Oh yeah. Like this doesn't really mean much at all. Does it? So, like, my mom was standing in for my sponsor, and, like, I felt no connection to becoming an adult at church that way. The way that I felt I became an adult at the church was becoming a Sunday school teacher. That felt like a rite of passage to me. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, when I was, like, in sixth grade, I was supposed to be uh, an assistant, and the teachers would never show up, so I kind of taught the Sunday school class. The teachers would never show up? They would show up, like, super late, or they wouldn't be there, and I'd be like, so, Sunday school! Damn, that's another way to, like, sort of undermine your feeling that this is important, if the adults aren't even seeming to take it seriously. But it certainly, like, set me up for a life of being a teacher. Like, yeah. knowing that I could handle it. And, but, yeah, it was like, I guess this doesn't matter. Interesting. Yeah, I think, in my case, the, the, the party scene, as you said, and expecting something more like that, and that never actually happening... Also, the club with the four of them. Yes. Um, and the fact that they always, like, got together that way every week, and they all went, which was just not, like, impossible. Like, yes. as a kid, that would not happen. And also, they talked so frankly about getting bras and getting their periods and everything. Yes! Oh, that's such a good None point. of my friends did that. I tried. I had a club called the Wild Blossom Sensations, because guess which book I read <sighs> right before... I made this club and I tried to make these rules and you're like, let's talk about like bras and periods. And everyone was like, you know, no, (laughs) we're like, we're nine. We don't care about this. But, but Margaret. Yeah. Yeah. It was like a combination of, of the girls that 
I was friends with either did not have interest or they were way too embarrassed to talk about yeah. it because their family was not frank about it with each other. And it was just sort of a, we aren't going to have to worry about that for a while. And so we don't have a right to talk about it yet. It's just weird, yeah. you know? Um, and so that was something that I had been sort of like expecting to come up as I made more friends and got older, that this would be something that we discussed more often. And it just never really was. And especially because I got my period before practically anybody I knew. Yeah. I was very much alone in that. Nobody even had that perspective or experience to draw from. So right. I wound up being the one that when girls got theirs, they would come to me asking me questions because mm-hmm. they knew I had gotten it. Well, I was going to ask, talk did about you tell people? Openly. So you did, yeah. Yeah, I was pretty straightforward about it. Because um, that was the, that was one advantage of, of my mother's upbringing. Because mm-hmm. if I had been, you know, very susceptible to what my dad was teaching, oh my God, yeah. it would have been a very different situation. I got kind of lucky mm-hmm. that she managed to, like, cut him off at the pass. Or uh, uh-huh. who knows what would have happened. Um, all right. Well, would you tell our audience, uh, where they can find more of you if they're looking for you? Sure. Um, I've got a public Facebook page that's, um, Carrie Ann Farrell. You can find me there. I'm on Instagram at in the back of my mind. I'm on Twitter as Carrie tweets, YouTube as Carrie sings just for you. Go Your Own YA is all over the place. Just search for Go Your Own YA. And we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, places that I probably don't even know exist because Marie does the social media. I don't even, I barely even know what that is. I'm so old. I never, I I downloaded it and tried to use it for like 20 and deleted it. I couldn't handle it. Yeah. Snapchat's Uh, beyond me. Yeah. I don't get it. Oh, and Forward March comes out on Tuesday. That's my young adult novel, and it's available right now for pre-order for paperback and Kindle on Amazon, and I hope to have it available on other channels as well soon. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me today and talking with me about this. This was super Um, fun. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was a blast. Yay. And uh, everybody, you know where to find Unspoiled, Facebook.com slash Unspoiled Pod, Twitter at Unspoiled Show, Instagram at Unspoiled Podcast, UnspoiledPodcast.com, and you can become a patron at Patreon.com slash Unspoiled. So I'm going to double check really quickly, I should have had this up, um, which book is coming up for the next uh, book club. Oh, I don't even have my own book, my own website on speed dial anymore. (gasps) I can't believe I did that to myself. I used to, I'd just type in un and it would fill it in and I would just click enter. And now it's Unico Nutrition because I bought some protein powder and it's decided that's the thing now. Rude. Um, ah, November is one that I have never read before. The Phantom Toll Booth. Oh, fun. So that'll be brand new to me, um, and I'll have to double check who has claimed that one as co-host, but a lot of people wanted to do that one with me. It's a pretty popular one, evidently, so I don't know how I managed to not read it, but... So yeah, everybody get ready for The Phantom Toll Booth um, as the childhood favorite for November, and The Martian as the uh, adult book club after dark. I wiggled my eyebrows, those of you who are not watching this. And we will see you next month. Toodaloo, motherfuckers.